Uh, my name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of your Fulbright Association, and I welcome you to our 40th anniversary uh, conference. It's a delight to see so many of you here. Uh, you know, we weren't expecting so many of you. Uh, there were supposed to be like 150 of you, and there are in fact twice that number. So in fact, our, our next move in this, yeah. Just, just, just tonight, our next move apparently was to use this strange spot on the rug here for you to sit. Uh, so I'm glad you don't need to use that. Um, Anyway, I'm, I'm very glad to, to, uh, to be with you this evening. Uh, over these next few days, uh, you'll have the chance at our conference to reconnect with old friends and to make new ones. You will learn how our association continues to grow and embrace our mission of advocacy and international education. You will join a community of researchers who, as we share our findings and discoveries. In fact, tomorrow afternoon, we have nearly 50 round tables, uh, research round tables, and nearly 60 poster sessions uh, tapping into a key strength of our community. You'll enjoy a few new features to, uh, to this conference, which is exciting. One of my favorites is a renewed attention to professional development. Morning and afternoon sessions tomorrow will focus on the transition from Fulbright, Fulbright, Fulbright to career and we'll follow that with individual career, develop, uh, career counseling sessions, thanks to many volunteers from the counseling profession, which is uh, really exciting. So we have both the combination of conversation and counseling, so it's, uh, it's really terrific. On Monday, you'll also get updates from Fulbright programs around the world. You'll marvel at the work of our chapters, and you'll learn how to ask your senator for a quarter billion dollars. <laughs> Oh yeah. We're ex very excited that over 200 of you have committed to visiting Capitol Hill on Tuesday for 130 meetings all over the hill. It's unbelievable. <laughs> truly, truly incredible. This is an important time because of threatened cuts to the Fulbright program and an historic moment for all of us in this community. By connecting our conference to advocacy for the first time, we have therefore nearly tripled the number of people we've ever sent to the Hill at one time and double the number of offices that we've ever been with, which means that we will be introducing ourselves to people who have never had a sit down on Fulbright. It's extraordinary. Um, in fact, I think the impact will be huge That's the last reference I'll make. <laughs> With advocacy at the heart of our mission and this conference, engaging each other in public policy discussions, as Mary Ellen has just now, uh, will, will be very important and integral to the entire field for the next few days. Tomorrow morning, we'll start that, uh, we'll, excuse me, we'll continue that with a discussion on human rights globally. Our afternoon plenary is also exciting and topical. Alumna uh, Barbara Crossett, a journalist with The Nation, leads a conversation on the politics of foreign policy with Mark Pryor, a former uh, U.S. Senator from Arkansas and a member of the State Department's Policy Board, and Larry Pressler, a Fulbrighter to uh, Italy and a, a former full, um, Senator himself. I'm sorry to report that uh, just yesterday, Senator Dick Luger, uh, had to bow out of that session uh, for, for health reasons, yeah, and he has to recover, so we wish him uh, a, a fast recovery. Um, throughout these four days, we ask that you post to social media uh, using the hashtag Stand for Fulbright. Uh, this is very important as you go th uh, through your uh, next couple of days to raise our profile and to share our experience. Uh, we want to build on the momentum of that campaign that went through the summer, uh, please post pictures, ideas, updates, all of this contributes to raising our profile and driving our mission forward for advocating for the program and sharing uh, in international education. I hope you've enjoyed our diplomatic reception this evening uh, and got to meet some of our fellow diplomats uh, here in Washington. 
I choose the term fellow, of course, because Fulbrighters have been populist diplomats for over 70 years. Whether we are Americans traveling to 165 countries around the world uh, or internationals visiting communities all over the United States, we are charged with connecting to communities where we are to share our understanding and to show mutual respect. So I'm glad that everyone got a chance uh, to meet and be part of our family of diplomats. Our next speaker, delivering our keynote address, has embraced her role as a populist diplomat with characteristic gusto and enthusiasm. I first met Charity Tillman Dick in my office at Johns Hopkins University, where I was Dean of Academic Affairs and coach to national scholarship applicants, including Fulbright. The first time you meet Charity, as you're about to learn, is an experience that truly defies description. She is a force of nature, I, I, I tell you, and that is when nature is at its most beautiful and creative. Her love of life, of exploration, of music, of the international was so obviously perfect for Fulbright. Absolutely perfect. Winning the grant and traveling to Hungary for an adventure in music and politics was as inevitable as it was important. As her Fulbright advisor, all I had to do was help channel all of that uh, amazing energy into an application. And those of you in the room who who do this for a living, you know what I'm talking about. Of course, then the next thing I did is the same thing you would do, and that is take credit for her success. <laughs> and succeed she has. Charity is one of America's fastest rising stars, no doubt about it. Soprano soloist, recording artist, uh, uh, important author, as I'll talk about later, and of course, TEDx diva. As you will learn, she has overcome extraordinary medical challenges to continue her singing career. She has run over those challenges, flattened them with determination and the help of a lot of skilled doctors, nurses, musicians, teachers, and of course, family and friends. I am so proud and so delighted this evening to welcome my, my okay my student and my friend for your keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, and my fellow Fulbrighters, please join me in welcoming Charity Tillman Dick. Thank <laughs> you. 
October 26, 2008, nine, I woke up from a 34-day coma after having undergone a double lung transplant. Now, typically, I would go on and I would tell you more about my saga. But there's a book for that. You should all get it. It's great. Um, tonight, there are going to be a few things that are different from when I, I usually speak. Um, I almost never speak with notes. I specialize in typical diva fashion in talking about myself. And I actually know myself relatively well. We've been together for about 34 years. And, um, and so, so I don't need notes when I talk about myself. And while my story will be somewhat integrated into what we'll talk about tonight, it is tertiary to what's most important about what I'd like to say. Now, the other thing, it's not so important, but I am wearing black. And my name is Charity Sunshine. And Charity Sunshine doesn't really wear black. So you guys just must be very special because I take you very seriously to wear the most serious color. Um, as a species, we are fascinated by paradox. At the most basic level, it fuels us. But our immune system and our genetic code seem to be at odds as one banishes everything foreign and the other thrives off diversity. The cultural amalgamations facilitated by the Fulbright program offer another pro opportunity to know the foreign and ourselves. As a descendant of one of Hungary's largest minority groups, my time there as a Fulbright amplified both my sense of belonging and otherness. Hungary is situated at a cultural, musical, and militaristic crosswalk between worlds and ideologies. From the sauces rich with sour cream and paprika, the music steeped in passionate longing, and the history stained by the blood of minorities and the patriots who tried to protect them. My childhood danced with Hungary's dueling identities. We grew up wearing Hungary's embroidered dresses in the summer and heavy woolen shepherd's coats in the winter singing peasant songs and making delicacies. We celebrated Hungary's achievements, but we were also keenly aware of how easily political pragmatism turns to perilous moral pliability. As doctor to the Habsburg court and soldiers in World War I and business people, my mother's family's Hungarian patriotism was storied. Then a wave of ethno-nationalism swept across the country. Hungary's homegrown fascists, the Arrow Cross, shot one of my great-grandfathers on the Danube's banks, while one of my grandmothers was gassed in Auschwitz. My grandmother was smuggled out of the country after be and then after being beaten and recaptured over and over again, my grandfather escaped to labor camp, spending the rest of the war working in the resistance within the network of Raul Wallenberg's safe houses. What was left of my mother's family emigrated to the United States and after the war, they began to build a life here. Three generations later, in 2003, I was back in our motherland, without much grounding in the language, studying one of Hungary's proudest fields, music. On one of my first days in the country, I waited for a tram with my older sister, who was a missionary there at the time. A man about my age stepped in front of me with a khaki backpack covered in hand-drawn replicas of the arrow cross insignia. It was a chilling sight. I thought the group had died shamefully with the end of World War II. Without grounding in the language, I didn't know what to do. I gestured to my sister. 
she took a deep breath, stepped toward the young man, and asked him why he would showcase a symbol that carried so much hate. By the end of the conversation, he'd taken his pack off to dispose of it. It was clear that he was a relatively simple person, and telling him about the fate of our family seemed to sincerely touch him. He must have been an outlier, I told myself. And as long as people speak up, Hungary will be just fine. A few days later, I was walking down the street with a Hungarian friend of mine who asked about my pick for the next presidential election. I named a potential candidate, and his face turned red in a combination of anger, horror, and frustration. How could you say such a thing, he asked. He is a Jew. A Jew can never be president of the United States, just like a black man or a woman. This wasn't some kid from the country. This was an educated part of my inner circle from a good family. My shock only served to reinforce his bigotries. The following spring, I was readying myself for my first big concert. It was May 1st, 2004. Books in tow, I headed toward the chain bridge from my flat in Buddha's ancient hills. Rounding the corner, I could hardly move. The entire country had come out to celebrate. Hungary was joining the EU. Left and right, young and old, for Hungary, this was a historic move forward. As I collected tulips from the Netherlands, others got beer from Belgium and gifts from the rest of the country in the EU. Hungary seemed like it would finally take its place among the democracies of the world, turning its back on the insecurities that had allowed past atrocities to catch fire. In my own life, triumphs and fainting spells punctuated what felt like a remarkable year. I was certain the fainting spells weren't anything serious. Possibility populated every corner of my world, and I wasn't going to squander it, worrying about potential problems. I went home to Colorado for a checkup and found the fainting spells were related to an extremely rare condition called idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension the endothelia, or the blood vessels that lined my lungs, didn't absorb oxygen properly, making my heart work overtime. I was kind of like the reverse Grinch. My heart was three and a half times too big. Life expectancy was not good at the time I was diagnosed. It was two to five years, and I was diagnosed with a stage four case of the disease. After a medical trial and more traditional therapies, my condition had stabilized, and by 2006, I was able to accept a fellowship to go and study in Italy. Soon after arriving, I met a famous old conductor who started casting me in all of these roles that I had dreamed of singing since I was a little girl. And while I was there, I found out that I had received a Fulbright to study in Hungary. And I was going to learn about one of their internally most famous composers named Ferenc Erkel, who is not known almost at all outside of their borders. And they wouldn't just be studying, I'd be studying with one of my musical heroes, Eva Marton, who was an only one of the greatest sopranos of the 20th century. She was also the greatest interpreter of his music in the world. When I arrived in Hungary, my Fulbright family was filled with filmmakers, epicureans, painters, archaeologists, journalists, and researchers. This group and its organizers offered a kind of emotional and intellectual home reintroducing me to my family's country of origin and giving me a place of belonging. It reinforced my impression that Hungarians and Hungary had chosen progress. But progress isn't a panacea. The costs are significant. Prices spiked, 
With just enough to survive, many Hungarians sought work in more affluent European countries. The pre-Trianon treaties map of Hungary, a dog whistle for Hungarian nationalists, started going up everywhere across the country. My Fulbright immersed me in Hungary's musical world, an oasis from outside political pressures. Inside of the List Academy, con uh, convocation was played by a brilliant ethnic Roma pianist. The first master class was sung by a Chinese migrant with a luscious spinto voice tailor-made to sing Puccini and a devastatingly handsome Hungarian movie star and baritone was perpetually near expulsion because he was spending too much time making movies and not enough time on his music. All of us understood what a privilege being part of the academy was. It represented the very best of Hungary and the world. Whatever culture wars were raging outside, here a meritocracy reigned. And the only way in or up was talent, hard work, and grit. As the year continued, I delved deeper into Erkel's music. My debut with the Hungarian National Orchestra was scheduled. Outside of the Academy's walls, another story was playing out. Each weekend, my friends and I, along with thousands of other Hungarians, would pour onto the chain bridge for a market and festival. But as the summer came to a close, men in black began to appear on the bridge too. At first, there were just a few, and then numbers doubled again and again and again. Their presence changed the atmosphere. And soon we stopped going. It didn't feel safe. Earlier in the year, a paramilitary nationalist group was formed. And, in, and as the months wore on, their numbers swole, as did their protests and vitriol. The hate infected conversations with friends and acquaintances, where every discussion inevitably turned to personal attack and insults of individuals or politicians. Press coverage became increasingly partisan, posing policy disagreements as good versus evil. Friends who used to be close to one another stopped associating because of political affiliation or pushing the left, uh, pushing the left and right even further apart and decimating the already feeble political center. It came to a head the week my grandfather was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, which happened to be the same week I went into the hospital with a serious case of pneumonia. Between shots, infusions, and x-rays, my fellow Fulbright, Paul Morton, would visit, a few Ferrero Rocher in hand. As we munched on chocolates, he'd give me a copy of the Budapest Sun and recap the most recent nationalist protests and counter-protests outside of the synagogue on Dohoin Street or the Parliament Building. On the one hand, I was proud of so many Hungarians. Hate exists in every society. What mattered was that Hungarians were showing up to say, not here, not now, not again. On the other hand, too many Hungarians seemed to be returning to an ideology of nationalism or indifference. And the outrage on the other side seemed to amplify, not dull, the message of hatred. Soon after my debut with the Hungarian National Orchestra, my grandfather passed away, followed by my father two months later. My condition, which had stabilized, worsened dramatically, and about a year later, in September of 2009, I would undergo a double lung transplant. I couldn't breathe for about two months, walking, talking, eating, and doing everything else came later, but over a hundred days after I entered, I went home from the hospital, and then I began to sing. 
I had retrained and I was performing around the country when I contracted a virus. My lungs were irreparably damaged. I had chronic rejection, which led to another transplant in 2012, which has brought me here six and a half years later. Soon after my debut, oh, I already told you about my debut. Now I want to tell you about our genetic code, which thrives off diversity. It's literally what makes us strong, vital, and resilient as a species. Inherited genetic disease almost seems like nature's generationally amplified punishment for exclusion as we procreate along the same bloodlines and within the same ethnicity. With the immune system, everything is different. Whether a germ, bacteria, or even a baby, everything is to be warded off or destroyed. Its primary objective is to fight off foreign objects, protecting us from splinters, infection, and viruses. But immune systems are also why nearly 50% of pregnancies end in, mis in miscarriage. In transplant two, this physical fortification is fatally misguided. The transplant dream is a union where the donor organ and the host become one without the need of immunosuppression. While there have been isolated cases of this transformation, the search for how to make the body see other as self continues. It is the same quest preached by churches and humanists alike. Transplant medicine brings this ethical ideal into sharp focus. And in a way, so does the Fulbright. The Fulbright Association helps us to achieve that elusive goal, where we recognize that which was once foreign as a same sister sojourner in search of belonging, progress, and hope. The exchange of, cultural, of culture by, a program, by programs like the Fulbright are like the societal vaccines, exposing other cultures to a very small part of our own culture, inoculating us and those we meet against the fears and phobias we may have to people and cultures that are different. Or, if you prefer, Fulbright's temper, the global immune system, allowing foreign to sit with native, offering vital tools for the future of one society, and a chance for a new understanding of life for another. Hopefully, when we return home, a piece of that experience remains, making us better able to reach out to those with different experiences, political affiliations, and beliefs, and to find common ground. In medicine and policy, every solution creates new challenges, but these challenges demand even greater creativity, collaboration, and integration. Sometimes it is in those things that we see as foreign or problematic that we find progress. Today, I breathe with the lungs of a Honduran immigrant, and I sing with the determination of a woman who was seeking a better life. Despite our differences in death, she and her family chose to give me and others an encore, a second chance at life. Over time, the greatest threat I face has turned from foreign infections to cancers, which the immune system struggles to identify and fight, precisely because they are not foreign aliens. Instead, these are misguided and diseased parts of myself, which have marred some of the most cherished aspects of my own physical identity, my face. And today, some of the most promising therapies for cancer come from plagues that have nearly been vanquished, like polio. Over time, our fascination with seemingly contradictory inputs, ranging from mythologies, chimeric animals, hybrid plants, and golden doodles. Perhaps it is because at one level, we recognize that which is common, 
in that which seems most different. To close, I am going to share my grandfather's favorite story. While he was not an observant man, he loved a good rabbi tale. And this one, he thought, was the very best. Three pupils sat with an old rabbi who posed a question. He said, how do you know when the dark turns to dawn? The first pupil raised his hand very quickly, and he said, well, as the animal approaches, you can see whether it's a dog or a wolf. And when it's dark, you don't know that. I said, no, that is wrong. The next pupil, now hopeful because of the other's failure, raises his hand. He said, I, I know, I know. It's when the dew gathers in the center of a leaf in a droplet that can be collected. The old rabbi shook his head, disappointed at how little his students had been able to learn. Finally, the quiet student in the corner looked up. He said, the dawn, the dark turns to dawn when a stranger approaches and you see your brother. In that moment, the old rabbi knew that the future held cold, dark, and wet nights ahead. But whatever challenges lay in the future, that dawn would eventually come, and it would be bright. Thank you so much. Um, can I sing one more song for you? Is that okay? This one isn't Hungarian. This is from Adriana Lukufurer, and um, it's in Italian. So, sorry, Hungary. You got one, though. So.